what I drank for lunch. But we have Dr. Eric Butter and Dr. David McCulloch. And uh, I'm just going to give you a, a quick little uh, brief here, bio here. Um, Dr. Butter is going to talk to you a little bit about today autism spectrum and, and how we can interact and, and deal with this in the EMS community. So. Great. Okay. And we have half, we have, turn this on. We have a half an hour, right? Yes. Can you hear this? Because I sure can. <laughs> okay, well, thanks for coming. I'm going to start off first with the first uh, bit of slides, and then I'm going to turn it over to Eric to finish uh, the rest of it. So we're glad to be here today. And the topic is autism spectrum, which I'm sure you've all heard about. It's in the news. Um, there's been some recent data that's been put out that I'll share with you guys, too. Okay, so the first question that we get a lot, too, that I'm sure is on your minds, is what is autism? Well, it's very complex. It encompasses many different factors. There's a genetic component to it. There's a neuropsychiatric component to it. And it's certainly neurodevelopmental uh, disorder as well. So these are the symptoms that are often seen very early in childhood, typically the age of uh, three or less, which is the clinic we work at, where we do most of our diagnostic work is with very young children. Okay. Um, if an individual has, an aut has autism, it is a lifelong disability. So the symptoms change and often get better as people with autism grow and get older and get treatment, but the core symptoms certainly remain. And I'll get into the core symptoms in a little bit. Um, in the world of assessing for autism, we generally think about three domains, three areas that we see that are present in a child um, where we start to think to put the label of autism on that child. I'll get, um, and I'll jump into them here really quick. The first area is deficits with language or communication skills. And this can vary widely. So we'll have some uh, people, some people with autism are nonverbal. Some people are kind of functionally nonverbal. They may repeat what you say. They may be able to label things in their environment, but they really can't have a reciprocal conversation with you. On the other side, people with higher functioning um, autism have the ability to say a lot of words, um, but it may just be about one circumscribed area of interest. And still, what you'll note is that difficulty with reciprocal back and forth conversation will be limited, or in, the, in the cases of very severe cases, lacking. So from our world, diagnostically, we're thinking of are there deficits in language skills, okay? The second area that we see in the autism spectrum is deficits in, again, and these two kind of play into each other, they're communication deficits and the social reciprocity, is deficits in social relationships. So what we're interested in is how does this individual um, interact with other people? Are they interested in friends? Um, do they come, like for children at least, do they come to their parents to share enjoyment, not just to mom to get the cookie j cookies out of the cookie jar, which is okay, but to give them to mom to play with her or to ask their sibling to, uh, or to bring a toy to their sibling to show them, hey, look at this cool new train I have, all right? Um, so social relationships are often very impaired in people with autism. And again, it could be more subtle or more serious where um, you could be sort of in the same room with somebody, but they're kind of in a different place. They're kind of in their own world, okay? So the first deficit is language and communication. The second area of deficit is deficits in social relationships, okay? That includes eye contact as well. We'll get into that a little bit later. And the, the, so those are two areas of delay. The third area that we look for diagnostically is the presence of something, the presence of unusual patterns of behavior. So we have up here compulsive or stereotype behaviors. Another way to think about it is behaviors that are repetitive, rigid, ritualistic. There's an insistence on sameness. Okay, there's an the inability to be flexible with some of the behavioral interests. And again, this could vary widely. Some folks with autism, um, move their hands in certain ways. They might flap them like this or flick fingers in front of their face. Um, other people with autism have a certain topic that they're very much interested in and can tell you everything in excruciating detail. If you think of some of the media portrayals of autism, um, in the famous movie Rain Man, right? He was into Jeopardy, remember? And he had to watch Jeopardy every day at whatever, seven o'clock, no matter where he was with Tom Cruise. They had to stop and watch Jeopardy or else he would get very upset. So the first two areas in our diagnostic world are deficits, again, commu communication language, and social deficits is the second. And the third is the presence of unusual, restricted, repetitive, or ritualistic behavior, okay? And just real quick, when we do our work diagnostically, we don't have a medical test for autism, okay? So we don't have a brain scan or a blood draw or an x-ray machine. I joke that if we could invent that, we would, and we'd be rich people. But 
It's a behavioral diagnosis, so it depends on what we observe, what the parents tell us, um, what other providers, teachers, pediatricians, therapists tell us as well, okay? Um, so those are the deficits that are seen in autism. The other thing that you come across in autism is the, the language that's used is varied and um, sometimes confusing, even to us at times. But we often think about that there's this spectrum of autism, okay? Again, like I've noted before, from very severe cases to more mildly or subtle cases, okay? And in our current uh, diagnostic manual, it's the, diagnostic, the, the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual put out by the American Psychiatric Association, they use currently five, five terms that they use um, for autism, okay? And they're listed down here, but I can show it to you in a different way to make a little more sense. So here's an umbrella, all right, which is to hope, hopefully <laughs> to represent the umbrella term on top of pervasive developmental disorder. So diagnostically, that's, that's the term we all use, and underneath that, there are, as it stands now, as it stands today, although about a year from now, it will technically change, Right now, there's five individual diagnoses that fall under the realm of pervasive developmental disorders. The one you're probably most familiar with, is, if I pull zapper works here, is autistic disorder, which, in summary, is really a case that we would see where sort of all the main criteria are met for autism. Um, it's maybe more likely to be a classic case. We have condition of Asperger's disorder, which is a situation that typically they're higher functioning individuals, and the 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 difference is a person with Asperger's should typically have normal language development and usually have a higher IQ, higher um, cognitive skills than someone with autism, typically. A third diagnosis you'll see, you hear about is PDD-NOS, which is pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified. You're familiar with the not otherwise specified from medical terminology, which is kind of a case where, yeah, there's deficits in communication and social and some repetitive behaviors, but doesn't quite fit classic autism, doesn't quite fit Asperger's, but we're in that ballpark, does that make sense? So we'll use this diagnostic label, okay? So if you come across a family member and they say, my, my, my sister here or my brother has PDD-NOS, that should go off in your head like this is autism spectrum, okay? These are, there are two other, uh, they're in blue because they're a little different. There are two other diagnos diagnoses that fall under PDDs. One is RETS, which is really a genetic disorder. So that probably will leave the world of pervasive developmental disorders in the next revision of the DSM. And the other is called childhood disintegrative disorder, which is really rare. Um, basically, it means that the kiddo's development was typical until a certain point, and then everything fell away. Okay? Another way to think about this, with, so, so th those are the diagnoses that you'll hear out there that are listed currently in the DSM-4, which is the manual we have. The DSM-5 is coming out, again, about a year from now, where they're thinking of removing Asperger's and PDD and kind of sticking everything under this umbrella term of autism, but a qualifier for how severe it is, because it clearly um, differs in severity by individual. Another way to think about this is a triad of impairments, right? So the, uh, the bars are the three areas, right? Communication, social, and repetitive behaviors. And they can move from more severe to less severe for each individual person. And in general, I'm kind of summarizing here, but we think about the more severe category as being more likely to be the label of autism, Asperger's is kind of in the muddled middle, and PDD-NOS as maybe more um, less, less, less impacted. The person's less impacted by autism, okay? So again, we don't have any clear cut rules here, okay? It's a lot based on um, what you see, um, the, the clinician you're working with. And the other tricky thing about autism spectrum is there's all these co-occurring problems that fall along these, this con as a continuum across all three areas. For example, behavioral challenges. Some autistic individuals engage in self-injurious behavior. They may aggress towards others. Many have pretty significant learning problems. Many do fall into the category of mental retardation, technically. Um, many have gastrointestinal GI problems. I can't say it. <laughs> GI problems, OK? Several have seizures. So there's all these co-occurring problems that just kind of make it very much um, a mixed bag, OK? So, Expect the unexpected, <laughs> okay, because these are very complicated, complex individuals. Our site is part of a large study. We're trying to figure this thing out, but I doubt we'll have any one perfect answer anytime soon. Does that make sense? So that's kind of a very brief overall summary about the diagnostics and the criteria, okay? So what I want to do is kind of do some bullet points for you guys, and then um, for a couple slides, and turn it over to Eric to talk about how you can interact with individuals with autism in a compassionate and effective way. 
Okay, so first thing is people with autism are common. The CDC out of Atlanta put out recent statistics a month ago, maybe, um, about one in 88 people is um, on the autism spectrum. For males, it's one in 54. For girls, it's one in 200 something. So it's different. It's more like in males, okay? But so those are the recent estimates from the CDC in Atlanta. So basically, you're gonna come across this. People with autism are very diverse. It knows no racial, ethnic, social boundaries, although like I said before, it is overwhelmingly a male disorder, okay? So it's not like it only appears in an African-American population or a Caucasian population or, or rural or poverty or anything like that, okay? It's quite, quite diverse. Um, sadly enough, a lot of people with autism are very vulnerable, although the media and movies may think us have, uh, may want us to think of the person kind of down the street talking to themselves is going to attack somebody. It's more than likely the opposite. They're far more likely to be victims of crime than to perpetrate a crime. So in your work of responding to something on, on an assault or, or um, something on the street is to be alert to that, that they, the victim themselves may unlikely be a person with autism spectrum. Okay, so there's a few kind of talking points. A few more. People with autism are medically complex. The study, I, the research project I mentioned that we're, our clinic is a part of is really trying to tackle this question of all the medical um, uh, comorbidities for people who have autism. A pretty good chunk have seizure or seizure disorders, so that's something to be aware of too as you're doing an evaluation. Many have genetic disorders, that's our kind of current focus, is what are the genetic components that um, are likely to lead to the behaviors of autism. Like I said previously, many have GI problems and um, maybe 40 to 50% have some pretty significant learning disabilities, cognitive delays, those kinds of challenges. Okay, so these are complicated folks. Um, if we think about the core symptoms, right, the three areas, let me jump into that a little bit. People with autism have a hard time verbalizing and communicating with others. Okay, remember, that's part of the diagnosis. So up to half-ish, maybe a little less, maybe completely nonverbal or kind of functionally nonverbal. Okay, so again, they may have a few words here and there. They can say some phrases that may be repetitive or scripted, as we say. So right off what they hear on TV or right what you said, they may say it right back to you. Um, so at your first impression, your first interaction with them, they may appear deaf, okay, because they're not talking to you. They may have trouble, again, at our core symptoms of difficulties in um, social and language skills, difficulty understanding what you are telling them. Almost, almost exclusively, many of the folks who are probably moderately to severely impacted have a really hard time understanding uh, directions and what you're telling them to do. So we'll have some hints on that in a little bit. So those two areas kind of tackle that first part of deficits in language skills. In the world of social interaction, which is part of the diagnosis, many people with autism make very poor eye contact. So the challenge for us, or when you interact with them uh, immediately, is you don't want to view this as they're non-compliant, they're combative, it's not that. Um, if they're looking past you, it's okay. I wouldn't try to force it on them, okay? Because they have a hard time in that reciprocal social domain of when we meet somebody, we look at them in the eye. It may not happen for them. People with autism, like I said previously, thrive on routine and repetition. So if you are going into a home, their environment is being disturbed, obviously, because it's some sort of emergency. And so they may become very upset. So they may take off, run off, hide, dart, those kinds of things, okay? Um, so if there's a caregiver present, you wanna try to get some idea about what the typical routine is and how to try and um, minimize that. In the third area of the repetitive, um, repetitiveness of autism, like I said previously, some people have repetitive motor behaviors. So they'll pace back and forth, flap their hands, rock back and forth, twirl objects, be attached to an inanimate object like a piece of string, um, a shoe, I mean, it could be anything. So you may experience that as well. Um, and the general rule of thumb is if it calms them down, let them keep it. It's not gonna hurt anything, it's not gonna, it's not gonna interrupt your work and the safety that you need to maintain in the moment, let them keep it. Um, people with autism are prone to wander. We have this conversation with families many times at our clinic. Um, I've had some families actually have a little ankle bracelet on that's, uh, that um, is hooked into the fire department. So if the child is gone, they call the fire department and they activate it like a GPS system, I'm sure you guys all know this, and we can find where the kid is. I had one kid that was, run, she was little, I don't know, three, um, very impaired, 
um, still seen at our clinic, just running down Livingston Avenue. Fortunately, she had shoes on, just you know, oblivious to the world around her, and some sweetheart <laughs> stopped and kind of scooped her up, understanding that there's something you know, off with this girl, and they found her pretty quickly. But imagine the scariness for that family. She figured out by watching mom how the garage door opened, so mom you know, went to the bathroom, and she pushed a button, and phew, out she went. So no danger. Um, so families may have a lot of locks, okay? And people with autism often have unusual sensory experiences, okay? They may not experience pain, heat, cold, as the rest of us do in a typical manner, okay? So even though there are, they are obviously injured, all right, they may fail to acknowledge that. And we hear that again from our families that we work with. Um, and some may show some unusual reactions. So they may start to laugh or sing or hum. And you're thinking, what is going on? Is this person you know, schizophrenic or something? What is going on? But that's not it. Um, potential, it could be, but miss, that may not be it. If it's autism, it may be how they're dealing with the, the, the stress they're feeling and the pain that they have. Okay? Um, we're good on time? So uh, that's a quick overview about the autism spectrum, our diagnostics. Um, and I'm going to turn this over, if I can figure this out, to Eric. <coughs> Here. This is the important one for the TV cameras, I think. All right. So um, I think David was hinting at that we're part of a large network of research and clinical sites around the country that's called the Autism Treatment Network. It's funded by Autism Speaks. I bring that up only because um, one of the, the things that you could probably do if you're interested in learning more or getting deeper into what we have to say here today is go to autismspeaks.org. Um, a lot of the information that we're presenting here today is conveyed through that website in lots of different manners, through different video modules, through um, handouts that you could use, to even uh, toolkits that were specifically designed for different kinds of medical care providers, including uh, EMS workers. So um, autismspeaks.org, uh, think of what the March of Dimes was to birth defects. Uh, in the last 10 years, we've been fortunate enough to have this organization develop um, for autism specifically. Uh, check it out. Um, you'll find a lot of coherent information that's consistent with what we're saying here today. Um, I value more, uh, probably than anyone else, the work of, of, of EMTs. Um, emergency service workers were uh, often called to the summer camp I used to direct. Um, and it was a camp for children and adults with autism. Um, and the one thing that I remember about the EMTs either that we hired to work on camp or the emergency responders that came when an emergency got beyond what we could do um, was that their general way of approaching their work, their usual best practice, was actually pretty informative for how we should be responding to our individuals on an everyday basis. So, so much of what you already know how to do is probably going to be effective in so many of these situations. Remember to just to keep the child, the adult with autism safe. Your goal is to be effective, efficient, um, but be compassionate and be comprehensive. Uh, don't let the unusualness of what's being presented to you shut down your best practice. Uh, so we just wanted to throw a slide up that remem reminded that. A few other things, um, just some tips that come up that are specific to the diagnosis that I think maybe um, would be relevant to you. Uh, in some uh, homes, um, houses have been set up to keep kids safe. It may not be that the house is um, in some way a, a dungeon of torture. <laughs> um, if you see too many locks, or the furniture is arranged in an odd way, or the child's room only has a bed in it and nothing else, and it looks like you know, uh, it's an Eastern European orphanage. No. Um, in many cases, the, the family has had to make these measures to keep their child safe at home. Um, I think David mentioned that in an emergency situation, children with autism, even high-functioning children with autism who maybe have a higher IQ than me and you combined, probably not, um, not combined at least, um, uh, may not have the words or the emotional capacity to cope with a stressful situation. And they may shut down, and they may run, and they may hide. So, and in fact, maybe you're responding to an emergency that involves their parent. But the parent in the midst of a hypertensive crisis, perhaps, is telling you, my son, my son, where is he? And you or your partner may have to go help find the child in the family. Um, 
Also in an emergency, or at some point during an emergency, very suddenly, when you think you have the situation under control, the person with autism may dart, may bolt off. Just be alert, because you can't predict what's going to set them off, what they're not going to like. Um, it's recommended that you move slowly, especially with your physical exams. Go um, distal to proximal. Don't restrain if you can avoid it, like any animal, including those of us in this room, uh, but also our dogs and cats at home. Uh, children and adults with autism, if they're restrained, are going to do what? They're going to fight back. They're going to fight back to get out. Um, and so if you go to restraint first as your first way of controlling a situation, you pretty much have um, written the story for the, how the rest of the interaction is going to go. Best if you can tell and show, because very often people with autism spectrum disorders do not have the receptive language understanding that uh, you might expect. They might have expressive language abilities that far surpass their understanding of language, which is very unusual. You, you can say more than you can understand. And so it's really important that you show someone what you want them to do or what you're about to do um, and not just tell them. Um, speak quietly, be simple, um, repeat your instructions, say it the same way. You don't necessarily need to say it differently if the person didn't understand what you wanted them to do. They just might need to hear it a second or third time. Allow extra time for someone to respond to you. Uh, as you might do with any confused patient, um, be careful of, of the answers that you get back and in interpreting them. You know, the yes, no answers may be random. They could be misleading. So invert your questions to be sure. Learn about their verbal skills beforehand if possible. Inquire with caregivers or teachers or wherever you've been called to. Um, how much does this person understand? How much can they use language? And as much as I don't want you to restrain, sometimes a very simple guided physical prompt may be enough to make the situation happen. So instead of telling him to stand up from out there, I'm going to come out here and say, stand up. And he does a very good job with just a very gentle touch, right? Yeah. yeah. I call that guided compliance. Your command matches the physical prompt at the same time that you're delivering the command. Um, you might do that anyway. Uh, as I said, um, one, that's one of the things that I observed our EMTs doing uh, at, uh, at our summer camp um, before I even incorporated that into my general clinical management. Some individuals have alternative communication strategies. If they don't have the words, they might use an iPad. They might use pictures. They might use sign language. They might have other ways of communicating, even though they can make sounds, and even though they can maybe say words. We could have somebody who could script a whole half-hour TV show, word for word, emotional tone and all, and all the words that they're using. But they may not be able to ever creatively use language to describe how they're thinking or feeling. And in that case, they probably are using an iPad or they're using some other kind of alternative communication device. I think David mentioned this. If there are repetitive movements that aren't interfering with your exam or your ability to keep the person safe, let them go. This isn't the time to change their stereotype behaviors. They're probably soothing them. Uh, we believe that um, the repetitive behaviors that are present in autism are usually a way to reduce anxiety. Uh, touching uh, it should be delivered with cautiousness. Um, uh, people are sometimes resistant to touch, so be, you know if you try the guided compliance technique that I just mentioned and, and someone resists, don't try it a second time. And, and just be slow. Um, you know, some kids with autism spectrum disorders may love your sirens, and they might say to you, turn it on, turn it on, turn it on. And even though maybe in another situation you normally wouldn't, I don't know, I'm not your boss, I can't tell you to do this, if it keeps them calm and they're obsessed with your siren, turn it on, even if you normally wouldn't. Um, just don't tell your boss I told you to do that. Um, but very often, uh, kids with autism spectrum disorders are overly sensitive to loud noises, and they probably don't want your sirens on. Um, and uh, so if you know you're responding to a call that involves a person with autism, it's probably safest as you get closer to the house to turn them down. Again, I don't know what your roles are, uh, but if that's possible, um, it would be a sensitive response. You know, I think you, as you would do with any patient in a crisis situation, try to um, bring them to a quiet, private place if you can. Um, you know, in terms of assessing pain, uh, we don't have a good way to assess and identify pain in children with autism spectrum disorders or adults. 
Um, you know, the, historically, the FACES scale is something you might use with um, lower functioning individuals. Uh, we're not so sure it's valid in individuals with autism. Most likely, uh, these are individuals who have been used to getting lots of praise and encouragement for compliance and cooperation. So as you begin to see compliance and cooperation, be positive. Uh, allow the family to ride along. That probably happens most of the time. Um, call ahead to the ER to request a private setting or a quiet, quiet space. Let them know that they're receiving a, a person with autism into the ER. And then expect the unexpected. You might get called and, and, and someone's sick, but you don't really know why, but the parent's very concerned. Um, PICA is a very common comorbidity in autism spectrum disorder. So this is someone who might have ingested an inanimate object. You know, David and I treated a, a case about a year ago um, with some other folks at our clinic where, you know, they, they cleaned a kit out and they found five paper clips, a washcloth, uh, art, project. yeah, art projects from school, um, you name it. Right. Um, so just, just be comprehensive. Check, recheck all possibilities. Be patient, calm, deliberate with your voice and movements. Clear commands that are short. They're probably going to be very helpful. I mentioned the Autism Speaks web page. Uh, there are some other web pages up here that might be um, more helpful as well. Um, that's really all we got. If we had any time for questions, we do. We have a couple minutes. Be glad to entertain those. Yes, sir. Since your diagnosis is not <coughs> it's a very good question. It, it, there, there's significant risk. Um, you know, one of the things that we're doing at Nationwide Children's Hospital is a, is a comprehensive evaluation to make the best call possible uh, using multiple disciplines, neurology, developmental behavior, pediatric, psychology, psychiatry sometimes. Um, and so usually when a child comes through our clinic, we're feeling pretty confident that multiple disciplines have looked at them and we've provided a gold standard best practice evaluation you know, that is accepted for, you know, really around the world. Um, that being said, not everyone's diagnosed in that kind of clinic, um, and also we make mistakes. Um, we will probably tend to err on the side of being conservative, not making the diagnosis uh, when maybe it could have been made. And there are other going to there are going to be other places in our community where the opposite happens; they're overdiagnosing. One of our cautions is exactly the the, re, the the thing that you bring up, which is that we don't want to make a diagnosis of autism to explain a constellation of behaviors when, in fact, it might be a brain tumor. Or, or something else that has a clear medical treatment. Um, and so we want to be as accurate as possible in our diagnosing, and so we, we probably undershoot rather than overshoot. Uh, that isn't the same in every clinic. Do you find that parents will oftentimes classify their child with this diagnosis to explain away a behavior rather than to get a definitive diagnosis Sure, yeah. yes. You know, sometimes we talk about the diagnosis du jour, you know. Um, <laughs> you know for a while there it was, you know, and it might still be bipolar disorder in children. You know, if you got a, a grumpy <laughs> seven-year-old who um, likes to stay up late at night uh, and you take him to see the right doctor, that doctor might just label bipolar disorder on the kid. Um, and that happens in autism too. Uh, and sometimes it's be because it's pressed by the parents and they doctor shop. So if they, they go to one clinic that is comprehensive in their diagnostic approach and they say, no, we think this is ADHD and a little bit of bad parenting, um, we can help you with that. Well, that's work, <laughs> you know. Um, and, 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 you know, and, 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 and parent, we don't really say it's bad parenting. We, we, we convey it in a way that's more sensitive than that, but they usually see through our psychobabble. Uh, and and nobody, wants to, nobody wants to accept the blame. You know, they want a medical explanation. And if you look at the news and the TV and the newspaper, the medical explanation du jour is autism. So there are some f folks, I think, who do press us for diagnoses, and when we don't give them what they want, they, they keep shopping. So, you know, I think of a, of a recent uh, situation where a child came to us, we said no, they went 
back to someone else in the community, a reputable uh, institution in the community. They said maybe, sorta, uh, came back to us, we said no. They went back to another person in the other institution. They said, yeah, kinda maybe. They came back to us, we said no. Um, and finally, they said, don't go back there, this other institution, why don't you go to Cleveland? And they went to Cleveland and they got the diagnosis there. Um, and we still don't think, but the child's being treated in our community, so we're we're, we're relatively acquiescing to the, these other folks, but we actually think he's... Uh, you ever watch that show, uh, In the Middle? Or, or The Middle? You, you never watch that show? There's a character on there who um, whispers to himself. Uh, whispers to himself. He repeats what just said, but he was but otherwise relatively social and engaged and smart. Um, uh, there have been a couple presentations of that lately in our clinic, and people want to call it autism, but it really isn't, from what we can tell. Um, and David hinted that the diagnosis of autism is changing in about a year. Um, the, the diagnostic um, label will be autism spectrum disorder and not any of these categorical diagnoses that he reviewed. Um, and the criterion is going to really be about social communication deficits and repetitive and restrictive behaviors. Uh, they take language itself out of it. It's more about the social aspects of language that they're paying attention to. And just like now we think about children can have a high IQ or low IQ, we're going to see them as children who can have high language skills or low language skills, but really how you use those language skills that you have in social communicative ways is the way we'll make the diagnosis. And it's speculative right now whether that's going to increase or decrease the rate of diagnoses that we're getting in children with autism. There are emerging biological opportunities to make diagnoses. Um, every day, really, a new research study comes out with another susceptibility gene that's been identified, um, with another potential cause or link. You know, so you know, a, a couple studies out this month, one pointed toward uh, maternal obesity during pregnancy as a significant risk factor for a diagnosis of autism. Um, and that was a reputable study. It needs to be replicated. We need to understand it better. And I don't want you walking out of here thinking that, you know, 30-pound weight gains in moms is going to be a one-to-one -one correspondence with an autistic child later. Um, but it does seem to be a risk factor. Um, we also know that old sperm is a risk factor for um, autism. You know, we always talk about maternal age as a factor for, uh, for babies and that that could be a significant risk factor long term. But, and you know, you know, the Hugh Hefners of the world can keep procreating without any consequences. <laughs> um, but no, there does appear to be consequences even for us old guys, you know. Um, so the, the, the research keeps coming out. Uh, when we started, when Dave and I started in this business, um, our yield from genetic testing was about 9%. Meaning we know that most, 90% uh, of the time, autism is caused by some genetic condition. Um, but we only could identify it 90% of the time. Uh, now we can get up over 20% with our genetic testing to identify what is the related, you know, allele or, or mutation or deletion or duplication in the child's genome. I mean, just one other thing to mention about diagnoses. It, 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 we're, it's a growing metaphor for us to say that we have autisms just in the way we have cancers. Um, not that we have autism. It's not a, a specific thing. It's not going to have one cause. It's going to have multiple causes and it's going to manifest itself very differently in different individuals. Uh, and that makes your job really complicated. Because you know, if you're responding and you think someone has autism, well, we've just told you, it's an extremely heterogeneous apprentice presentation. So I think that's our time. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, Pat.